Hey, it's your guy Tyrell back with the interviews. In today's video, we're going to briefly analyze how Raheem Sterling and Harry Kane unlocked Denmark's five-man backline. So when we break down the game and we do look at the board, we have England starting in a 4-2-3-1 and Denmark starting in a 3-4-3. So first we're going to break down how Denmark looked to disrupt England and prevent them from creating chances, and then we're going to focus on how Kane and Sterling were able to impact the game. So as you can see, Denmark start the game in a 3-4-3, and out of possession they ended up dropping off into a 5-4-1. That saw Damsgar and Braithwaite dropping off into narrow midfield positions, and they were looking to tuck in narrow to compress that midfield zone. You had Dahlberg looking to occupy space just ahead of Declan Rice. And what you ended up seeing was that he would look to close down the center backs, but his main priority was ensuring that Rice couldn't get on the ball. That ended up seeing Phillips looking to push forward, and we often saw him in that Damsgaard Delaney gap. And if he did look to push forward into that final third, then Delaney would track his movement. That enables Hoybier to hold a deeper central position. And we often saw Mason Mount looking to push forward and try to receive the ball between the lines. The problem was that England couldn't get the ball into their attacking players in those central positions. And what you ended up seeing was that Sterling was looking to drift and narrow in between Christensen and Larson, And Saka was holding the touchline ahead of Mail. So ultimately, when you do look at this shape, Denmark were fairly comfortable. If they were dropping off deeper, Damsgar and Braithwaite could shift out to Shaw and Walker. Saka was holding the touchline so that meant that Mail could deal with him and it allowed Vestergaar to tuck in narrow to deal with Kane with Kier. That meant that if Mason Mount was looking to receive the ball between the lines, even if the ball was played into him, Christensen could step forward to close him down, and when he shifted to the opposite side of the pitch, Vestergaard was able to step forward due to the fact that Saka was holding that wider position. And even when England looked to shift the ball out into those wider areas, specifically the left-hand side, if you had Sterling receiving the ball in that zone, Larson would shift across, and there were often times where Hoybier did shift over to provide cover. It ensured that it was a 1v2 and at times no England player was occupying Christensen and then he was able to shift across and even if Shaw made that overlapping run, the England left side is outnumbered. If Denmark looked to press higher up the pitch, what you'd end up seeing was that Dolberg would often leave Rice but he would press the center backs effectively. He would look to step into Stones or Maguire, but he was always blocking off the passing lane into Rice. And even if he was giving a full committed press, what you'd often see was that if he's stepping towards Maguire, Braithwaite would step out to Shaw, Hoybier would close down Rice, Phillips would be closed down by Delaney, and then Damsgar would be closing down Stones but blocking off the passing lane into Walker. And the same thing would apply on the opposite flank. If Dolbear was closing down Stone and Damsgar was shifting out to Walker, then you'd see Braithwaite blocking off the passing lane into Luke Shaw, while Delaney and Hoybier were stepping towards Rice and Phillips. If we look to an example of Denmark's pressing, you could see Braithwaite stepping towards Maguire, Dolbear blocking off the passing lane into Rice with Hoybier prepared to step forward, and Damsgar shifting narrow near Phillips. Maguire ends up dropping the ball back to Stones, and that's where you see Dolbear beginning to push forward with Damsgar and Braithwaite pushing towards Walker and Maguire. And you could see Hoybier and Delaney stepping towards Phillips and Rice. Stones ends up bypassing the Denmark press and playing the ball into Mason Mount. But that's where you see Vestergaar stepping forward to apply pressure and he ends up winning possession. Here you could see Stones receiving the ball from Maguire with Dolbear looking to step into the path of Rice. And that's where you end up seeing Delaney shifting across to deal with the movement of Phillips. Here you could see Dolbear looking to step away from Rice to apply pressure to the England center backs. And you have Hoybier stepping into the path of Rice and Damsgaard near Luke Shaw. And then here you could see Phillips on the ball with Delaney stepping forward to apply pressure. And you have Dolbear blocking off the path passing lane into Rice, with Hoybier prepared to step forward if Dolbear looks to step into the path of Stones or Maguire. As stated on several occasions, if England can't bypass the opposition's midfield bank to play their teammates into space between the lines or in the final third, then it does help to have Kane dropping off deeper into that midfield zone because he's able to retain possession 
and hold off pressure, and that's where you need Saka and Sterling to make runs in behind. As England fell behind to Denmark and they were losing control of the game, it was Harry Kane who dropped off into midfield positions and pockets of space to receive the ball, and he played a key role in winning England free kicks in dangerous areas, and playing Saka and Sterling into legitimate goal scoring positions simply by varying his movement. Initially, you could see Kane in the right channel receiving the ball from Phillips, and Vestergaard isn't looking to step forward towards him, and that's where you see Sterling beginning to make a run between Christensen and Larson. Vestergaard decides not to step towards Kane, and he gives him a free lane to deliver a ball across all three center backs for Sterling, and you could see Larson not tracking his movement. Kane's delivery does bypass all of the center backs, and it falls to Sterling in a position where he should be tapping it in to put England up 1-0. However, Sterling isn't willing to attack the ball, and it ends up rolling beyond him. Here you can see Maguire carrying the ball into Denmark's half, and you have Hoybier stepping into the path of Rice, and Kane dropping towards the right of Delaney who should be picking up Phillips. Maguire ends up bypassing Rice and Hoybier, and that's where you see Kane receiving the ball in between the lines, and Delaney immediately swarms him to apply pressure. That's when you end up seeing Kane spinning away from that Delaney pressure, but focus on Sterling and Saka. They're not in a position to be making runs in behind, and that forces Kane to turn away from goal, evade the pressure from Delaney, and he does well to ensure that he carries the ball into that zone, and that's where you see Delaney sliding in to commit the foul to award England a free kick in a dangerous area. Later on, you could see Saka running at mail with Delaney and Damsgar shifting across, and that's where you have a passing lane now for Kane to make a run in between Kier and Vestergaard for Saka to slide the ball across the center back. When Saka plays the ball across Vestergaard, Kane receives the ball in right half space to drag out Kier. And you can see Christensen tracking the movement of Mason Mount, and that's where Sterling begins to make a run across Larson. Kane ends up playing a first-time ball across both center backs, and that's where you see Sterling getting across Larson, but he's unable to beat Schmeichel from point-blank range. The build-up to England's equalizer, you could see Harry Kane dropping away from that Denmark back five and looking to move into the midfield zone. Walker ends up playing the ball into Kane, and when he receives it, you see Hoybier applying tight pressure towards him, but Kane instantly turns and that's where you could see Saka making a run off Mail and Vestergaard, and Sterling's prepared to run off Larson. Kane ends up sliding the ball into the path of Saka to place him in right half space, and once he receives the ball towards the byline, that's where you see Sterling approaching the six yard box, and only Kier can make a last ditch effort to prevent the cross from getting towards his teammate. But when Saka slides the ball into that six yard area, Kier ends up sliding the ball into his own net due to Sterling's pressure. Here you could see Walker pulling out Jensen, and Sterling dropping off deeper to occupy mail. What ends up happening is that Walker slides the ball across the wing back into the path of Kane making a run between Vestergaard and Kier, and Kane does well to hold off Vestergaard and when Kier comes across, he ends up firing a low effort on goal that forces a key Schmeichel save. In terms of the second half, we initially didn't see any major changes from Denmark, but what we witnessed was that now when Kane dropped off into those deeper positions in the midfield zone, he was swarmed by several Denmark players to ensure that he couldn't play positive passes into his teammates. Ultimately, it was Denmark who made the first set of tactical changes, and what we initially saw was that they ended up shifting into a 3-5-2. We saw Poulsen coming on for Damsgar, Daniel Was replaced Larsen, and that's where you saw Norgar replace Dolberg. That meant Poulsen and Braithwaite were up front, and that presented Denmark an additional midfielder in that central area. Now what you ended up seeing was that they matched up 3v3 in that midfield zone, Polson and Braithwaite were able to occupy the center backs, and if Walker and Shaw look to push forward into advanced positions, then Delaney, Norgar, or Hoybier, as that midfield trio did interchange, were able to shift out into those wider areas to close them down. However, Southgate on the other hand was reluctant to make significant changes. He ended up replacing Saka for Grealish, and that saw Raheem Sterling shift out to the right-hand side like we witnessed against Germany. And what you end up getting from that is now Grealish can run at Waz and Christensen. He's able to occupy those two players, and it could introduce overlapping runs from Luke Shaw. Whereas now Sterling is more inclined to take the ball towards the byline to stretch the pitch, and that's what we ended up seeing from him. However, similar to the left-hand side where Sterling was looking to cut onto his shooting foot, 
Here, when he picked up the ball, he was often closed down by Mail with Vestergaard behind him for cover, and Jensen was shifting across as well. As the game went to extra time, we ended up seeing Rice being replaced by Jordan Henderson and Foden coming on for Mason Mount. And what ended up happening there was now Henderson was shifting out to that right-hand side to try and make up the numbers, and Foden was pushing forward to occupy Vestergaard. Walker was often holding a deeper position near the touchline, but if Henderson was on the opposite side, Phillips was dropping off into the half space and Walker was looking to push a bit forward. But due to Walker's limited overlapping runs, Jensen was often willing to shift across, and that's where he needed Foden and Henderson to shift in those zones to make up the numbers. However, despite the numerical advantage down that right hand side, there were two key moments in that period where Sterling was able to carry the ball towards the byline, bypass the two markers, and get England into dangerous positions. Initially, you witness a 1v2 action on the right hand side with Jensen and Mail looking to close down Sterling, but Sterling looks to cut towards the byline and he bypasses both players, and that's where you see Vestergaard and Norgard prepare to shift across to provide cover. Where Sterling could play in Grealish or Kane breaking in towards the 6 yard box, it's Vestergaard who comes across to make a vital tackle. And then when you look to the build up to England's winner, you have Sterling occupied by Mail and Jensen, and you see Foden looking a step forward just out of Vestergaard. As Sterling looks to take on Mail, you also see Hoybier looking to shift across to make it a 1v3, while Foden carries Vestergaard into the penalty area. Sterling ends up carrying the ball around Mail, and when you look at the penalty area, the only option that he has in the box is Kane who's closed down by Anderson. As Sterling gets the better of Mail towards the byline, that's where you see Jensen looking to shift across to provide cover, but when he looks to make the challenge with Mail, that sees Sterling fall to the ground and England are awarded the penalty that ends up winning the game. So as you can see, a combination of Kane's varied movement and passing range along with Sterling's direct play was enough to overwhelm Denmark and place England in a European final with Italy. Hi everybody, thanks for watching and subscribe here for your latest tactical analysis and daily commentary on the interview show. And if that wasn't enough, don't forget you could find more organic, unfiltered soccer slash football analysis on the interviews podcast, the best soccer slash football podcast in the world, available on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and any Android apps on your Android devices.